Okay, so just a few questions here. Uh, do these tests only check for midline function? When we're assessing the cerebellum, we have to assess midline lateral function separately. So when you assess midline function, you're going to assess anything that is somatotopically positioned in the midline. So if you want to ch check, let's say, the vermis and the fastigium of the cerebellum, then you want to look at eyes and spine function. So you want to look at someone's uh, ability to hold themselves upright in gravity. You want to look at their heel to shin function. You want to look at their ocular motor function. Those are all midline tests. If you want to test lateral cerebellum, you're going to test someone's planning of movement, timing of movement, or you're going to test their dexterity in their in their uh, more distal uh, part of their extremities, like finger tapping, right, or something like dystiadocokinesia, where you're testing for alternating rap uh, rapid alternating movement of the hands. Now, if you, which all of us are familiar with, you want to test someone's cerebellar function. You have them put their arms out in front of them, then rapidly turn their hands. Uh, both from supination to pronation and back and forth. If you do it with the arms fully extended, well, then you're activating the proximal muscles of the shoulder when you do it. If you have them bend their elbows and put their body, in, their hands in close to the body, you take out the shoulder uh, girdle musculature, um, which are more midline proximal uh, 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 systems. Uh, so if I just want to purely test my lateral cerebellum, I'm going to test finger to nose, and I'm going to test this diadokinesia, but I'm going to test them with my elbows close to my body, right? So if I bring my elbow in close to my body, and then I check for this diadokinesia, I'm not using the more proximal muscles of the shoulder, so I can better localize uh, if there is a lateral cerebellar problem by doing a purely lateral assessment versus a mixed assessment. Um, or, of course, if you're looking for midline dysfunction and you, all you test is finger to nose, you won't see midline dysfunction as clearly when you test lateral cerebellar structures. So these tests that I'm talking about now, looking at oculomotor function or midline cerebellar functions, they are innovated by the, the vestigium and the, and the uh, vermis of the cerebellum, so those midline portions, and we'll look at those uh, today also. If I want to test more lateral aspects, then I test the finger to nose, dexterity in the fingers, things of that nature. Those are more lateral cerebellar uh, activities. So just remember the somatotopic distribution of the nervous system. Everything is uh, related uh, to a certain part of the body based on that what we call laminar topic distribution. Okay, and then the long track signs, I was interrupted with my water break, uh, my pipe broke, and uh, I was right in the middle of answering that question. But remember, in brainstem syndromes, when we have compression at the brainstem, when we have demyelination uh, disease, when we've got uh, compression syndromes, we're going to see crossed signs. We're going to see brainstem, nuclei signs, ipsilateral to the problem, and then we're going to see long track signs. Well, what are long tracks? Long tracks are tracks that start either in the brain and then descend down to target organs or start in the periphery, let's say, at a muscle or a joint receptor, and then they ascend. And those are the long tracks. So there are motor tracks and there are sensory tracks. And so you're going to look for, in brainstem syndromes, ipsilateral cranial nerve signs, like cranial nerve 3 loss or something of that na nature, and then a long track signs contralaterally. So somebody might lose pain and temperature sense in their right leg and also have a Horner syndrome in the left eye or a ptosis of the eyelid or a cranial nerve 3 loss or some other brainstem nuclei problem. And that crossed relationship helps you localize where the problem is. So in cranial cervical junction dysfunction, if you're looking for mechanical irritation to that area, well, we know that when you put compression on brainstem nuclei, they do not function well. And so if you've got compression at the brainstem 
and, and it's affecting certain nuclei. And this is why it's important to understand what nuclei live in the brainstem. And then you can also find a long track sign that's associated with it, contralateral to the brainstem finding, to the uh, cranial nerve finding. That's going to help you localize lesions to the cranial cervical junction brainstem area. Now, there are there is a continuum of function and dysfunction, right? So you may see a very subtle sign of dysfunction and to the untrained eye, it may be, oh, well, so what? So your eyelid hangs a little lower on the right or your pupil response is not uh, as robust on the right. And yeah, you've got, it feels a little colder when I put the, tuning, uh, the cold tuning fork on your lower leg on the left. It feels a little colder on the right than it did the left. But what does that really mean? You know, so this is what, uh, this is where we as chiropractors have uh, an ability to provide a service that is needed. If the patient doesn't have a progressive demyelinating disease or an ablative lesion like a stroke, and there's no finding an MRI, what is the typical medical neurologist or general practitioner going to do for that person who's got a little bit of a sensory deficit and a little bit of a cranial nerve finding? They're going to say, there's nothing wrong with you. Go home and live with your dysfunction. Uh, if it gets bad enough, if you do get a stroke or this does turn into BMS or, or uh, you know, um, uh, or CSF uh, problem, well, then you'll come back and we'll do emergency surgeries or we'll give you medications. Uh, as chiropractors, we are in a, in, a, in a position where we start to see these findings early on in their progression. And, um, uh, and also they could be just uh, less severe findings that localize mild imbalance, like in the upper cervical spine, you may have a subluxation that may not be causing much dysfunction yet, right? We learned in last month that things, things uh, have to potentiate over time. And because of the plastic nature of the central nervous system, when a condition is there for a long period of time, it starts to potentiate itself and the, the influence of that imbalance starts to become greater and greater, or the effects of that imbalance starts to become greater and greater. Remember when I said, when we talked about head position sense and we talked about the head direction cells and that whole uh, circuitry, that that becomes a learned behavior of the nervous system. Actually, the, the, the amount of uh, receptor uh, the receptor densities change, right? The the uh, effectiveness of the neurotransmitters change over time. So you could take a patient that has an upper cervical subluxation and you can correct it with an adjustment or maybe even have them consciously control the muscles and correct it. But unless it stays corrected for long periods of time, uh, it's not going to it's not going to translate into changes in the cytoarchitectonic uh, um, structures. You're not going to change receptors because you took someone's head from here and said, "Okay, make your head straight for me." Okay, now I fixed your problem. Well, you you might have fixed the problem uh, at that moment, but there's there's a learned response that's going to let it go back. And so you need to either do it over and over again, which is more akin to typical non upper cervical chiropractic, or you want to make a correction and then try and help sustain it there for as long as you can before you have to recorrect it. So you might use an orthotic on the neck, like a, a neck uh, a brace after an adjustment, or you might give the patient some learned, uh, some exercise behaviors to do. Uh, but ultimately, if you make a correction of a subluxation, and it made a change immediately. To me, that's like, it's like a short-term memory, right? And so if I tell you a phone number, right, 775-8135, and I ask you this number again, you might be able to recall it right this second, 775-8135. Then if I ask you again in an hour uh, that number, you may or may not be able to recall it. And why? Because 
just because I gave you the stimulus and I gave you the impetus to remember that number doesn't mean you you've done enough work to create changes in the receptors in your brain to make that memory long lasting so movement and learning in movement and our ability to hold our bodies in gravity and space is very very similar if you make a correction structurally to somebody's spine uh, that's like it's like a short-term memory if we can continue to work on it and make that memory more uh, get it to become more long lasting. Like if we sit here and we practice seven, seven, five, eight, one, three, five, and we start to uh, maybe create mnemonics and songs and then test each other, we'll build that memory, we'll build those synapses in our brain so that that memory gets stored in, in the long-term memory systems. Well, same thing with what you're doing with your upper cervical, okay? You're gonna try and create a motor memory that helps keep that alignment in place for for long periods of time so i hope that answers that question um let's go ahead and uh, keep looking at these ocular motor systems uh, and we'll see where that takes us so remember that we are going to look at these extraocular eye muscles and their functions in different positions in primary positions secondary positions, and then we get to see what those muscles do and if they're working uh, optimally. So just to go back to this here, this is showing torsion of the eye. Okay, so that's in torsion. So when the superior pole rolls to the nose, we call that in torsion. When the eye is in its primary position here, looking straight ahead, the superior oblique muscle is a torter. It torts the eye internally. But when this eye comes to the nose, that torter now becomes a depressor. So if I bring the eye, let's say, uh, towards the nose, and then I try to have the patient look down, right, when you're doing your cardinal signs of gaze, and we lose the ability to look down, well, that may be an indication of a superior oblique palsy. And why do we always talk about superior oblique dysfunction? And the, and the cranial nerve four, the trochlear nerve. The trochlear nerve is very susceptible to damage from head trauma, compression, uh, and things of that nature. So it is a, a finding that we will find uh, 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 more often than some of the others because of the long, tortuous uh, um, pathway of the cranial nerve four. It leaves the, the brainstem posteriorly, and then wraps around to the opposite side. So it actually innervates the contralateral superior oblique muscle. So here we're seeing that when the eye gets pulled to the nose, that the, now they're showing the superior and inferior oblique, they become elevators and depressors. What does the superior rectus and inferior rectus become? They become torters. So if I bring the eye to the nose and I see that we get torsion, it tells me that the superior oblique is not integrated well and that the inferior oblique, or I'm sorry, the superior rectus is torting instead of uh, letting the oblique muscles elevate and depress. So here's a schematic that kind of just gives you some overview on how to remember what these eye muscles do. All right, the uh, superior, inferior, lateral rectus, those are all pretty easy. The obliques are just opposites. So the superior oblique is a depressor. The inferior oblique is an elevator. Okay. All of this is here. You don't have to uh, master this information today. You can see this information over and over again. Okay. You guys have access to this. Um, I put this in your... Uh, in your references. This is a patient with hypomemia. Uh, and uh, or hyperemia. And it's basically just an increase in uh, motoric output of the facial muscles and the tongue. And there's a way to score this. And uh, you'll see this in uh, patients that have a condition known as tardif dyskinesia. Tardif dyskinesia is a is a overactivity in the basal ganglionic systems, 
and it's very common. It's a very common side effect in psychiatric medication. So if you have patients on psychiatric medications, you may see something similar to this, which is unwanted movements of the uh, uh, of the face, grimacing, puckering, things of that nature. Uh, if anybody uh, is watching the news and you caught a glimpse of the murderer down in South Carolina, Dylan Roof, you may notice that he's doing a lot of puckering, uh, lip smacking, tongue uh, protruding, um, and it's obviously a side effect of whatever medication they put that maniac on. Here's a more subtle uh, presentation, right? This looks like any patient you and I might see. You could see a very subtle sucking of the lower lip, and just like obsessive compulsive disorders or Tourette's or a tick or um, bilismus, these are all dysfunctions of the uh, basal ganglionic output systems. Okay, tremors as well can also be included in that. So you have this this uh, in your this uh, aims. Let me pull it up for you. You have this in your Google Drive. You go to Google Drive, you go to References, Patient Exams. You'll see here in the tools, uh, the AIMS tools, you've got the Abnormal Involuntary Movement Scale Overview. Basically, if you are dealing with these types of patients, uh, you're able to score their um, overactive systems. Um, and I just thought it'd be a good tool for you to have. Uh, this way you can do pre and posts and there's a way to score it, oral movements, extremity movements, uh, trunk movements, uh, and so forth. So this is for overactivity of involuntary movement. And you have that. Uh, okay. All right. So let's go ahead and pick up where we left off on our uh, presentation. So if we go to your Google Drive and you go to presentations, you can open up uh, the upper cervical diplomate syllabi PDF. And uh, let me see if I can open this. Yeah. So things here. Okay, so this is our presentation, and we work, we worked through uh, much of this uh, the first month, and uh, there are just some of these uh, initial slides. If we scroll down here. And we just look at the organization, the CNS organization. And I have a pyramid here with a hierarchy. And at the bottom of the pyramid, we've got the spinal cord. And then as you rise up the pyramid, we have all these uh, suprasegmental structures all the way up to the cortex. And remember that I said that everything in the nervous system, uh, everything above inhibits things below. All right. So the thalamus is inhibiting the cortex. The basal ganglia is inhibiting the thalamus. So everything below is inhibiting um, from above and vice versa. The midbrain is the uh, is the where the uh, reticular activating systems come from. The pontomedullary system as well. Cerebellum and spinal cord. We talked about uh, why we have a neocortex. And then this slide here is uh, uh, is a nice slide because 
it just makes things really simple to understand. Okay, you have a brain, and 90% of that brain is involved in creating activation uh, other than the primary motor strip. 10% of that brain we consider the motor strip. So if you have a patient that loses function to the right arm from a stroke, they basically lost the 10% drive that goes to that from the left brain to the right, right hand or right arm. The other 90% of the brain is doing something else. Okay, it's setting tone for the other side of the body. Uh, it's involved in all the higher, uh, the higher functions of the brain. And the 90% cortex that's involved in everything other, uh, other than the conscious motor control from the corticospinal tracts is basically modulating everything else. And that means that if we lose, we lose part of the 90% of brain, we're not going to lose function to the other side of our hands. Our hands are still going to move. We're still going to be able to consciously control our muscles, but we may start to lose other functions like the modulation of all of these systems. All right, so the next slide, again, is a nice representation that shows how these systems link up. We have our cortex above. 90% of the cortex projects ipsilaterally to the pontomedullary reticular formation in the brainstem. It's only 10% that projects to the mesencephalic neuronal pools which then has its influence contralaterally. Okay, so the 90% of brain that goes ipsilaterally goes to this pontomedullary reticular formation, and the pontomedullary reticular formation has integrators as well. It has the cerebellum, seen here, and also the vestibular cerebellum. Okay, let's see, we have no sound. We are muted, let's see. muted here. Mark, you're coming through on my end. Okay. Uh, I'm not muted. So, yeah, if we can get them back up. All right. I just turned yeah. the sound back on for everybody just real quickly. Is uh, everyone getting sound now? I guess you wouldn't know. Okay, Brian's got sound. They do not have sound at the double tree. You guys might need to reconnect. I thought I saw the double tree uh, drop down. Um, I'm going to make sure that they're reconnected to the audio. Okay. The good news is everything is being recorded. Oh, so okay, yeah. Come back and catch these parts if you uh, didn't hear. It. Yeah. The join uh, dot may not be designed for running a 12-hour webinar very well, so we might have to log off uh, every hour or two uh, just to refresh things. Okay. So for those of you that were. Uh, we're muted. Basically, we just talked about how the majority of the brain is, its function is to be modulating all the other, uh, uh, all the other functions related to it. And so when we see a stroke, we see somebody who has uh, paralysis on one side of the body or uh, hyperreflexia and, and the things that we associate with upper motor neuron disease, we're really looking at only 10% of the brain when we look at that. The other 90% of the brain is involved in modulating tone and function ipsilaterally. And so when we talk about these descending inhibitory pathways or um, we talk about creating postural muscle tone, those are systems that are the 90% of the brain. And so that 90% of the brain projects 
ipsilaterally to the pontomedullary reticular formation. The pontomedullary reticular formation is a group of neurons that are not well circumscribed into a nucleus, but they are responsible for all of our uh, vital abilities, so heart rate, respiration. They're also responsible for activating wakeful and sleep states or wakeful states at least. Uh, they're responsible for creating descending inhibition uh, of pain. Uh, without good pontomedullary function, you can have asymmetry of blood pressure in your body. Uh, so testing blood pressure on the right and left is a window into looking into pontomedullary function. Um, we, uh, if we have the inability to uh, desensitize ourselves from uh, pain, this is another issue of the pontomedullary system. So 90% of our brain does not integrate well into the pontomedullary system ipsilaterally, then we'll start to see dysfunction in that pontomedullary uh, uh, in those pontomedullary systems. And this is uh, a great tool for a functional doctor who's looking at uh, how things uh, integrate and, and how well they work. Now, if you did an MRI, you may not see any finding uh, of pontomedullary dysfunction. If you did brainstem testing of brainstem nuclei, like a brainstem auditory evokes potential or something of that nature or some out of sensory potentials, you may not see that this dysfunction is there. So having a good clinical uh, way to clinically assess it becomes very important. So we see that the cortex projects 90% of its input ipsilaterally to the pontomedullary system. It projects 10% of its input to the mesencephalic systems. These are those corticospinal tracts corticospinal tracts, okay? The cerebellum and the vestibular nuclei are our keys as chiropractors into this pontomedullary reticular formation because I can stimulate receptor systems in the periphery that have influence in the cerebellum and other brainstem and brainstem nuclei and that will integrate right into the pontomedullary reticular formation. Same thing with vestibular stimulus. So when we look at cervical, oh, I just got you guys back in uh, uh, in double tree. So we're looking at when the when the cervical spine, when I activate afferents to the cervical spine, those are going to have an influence over many pathways into the brainstem and cerebellum. And then those systems integrate to create modulation of pontomedullary reticular formation output. Same thing with the vestibular nuclei, and these really work hand in hand. I don't know how, as a cranial cervical junction expert, you uh, could divest the vestibular system from the cervical spine afferents. They are one, they work together, and uh, understanding how they integrate and where they integrate into, I think is gonna serve you guys really well. So when we look at this re pontomedullary reticular formation, remember these are the non-well non subscribed, uh, non-well circumscribed uh, new, uh, gray matter in the uh, pons and the medulla, and they are responsible for the reticular activating system for our vital signs, our um, uh, our vomit centers, apneustic centers, these are all in that reticular formation. So they're not the well circumscribed uh, nuclei. So there are really four things that I want you to know that the pontomedullary reticular formation is responsible for, okay? Number one, it inhibits ipsilateral pain. Without good pontomedullary descending serotonergic drive to inhibit pain in the periaqueductal gray areas of the brain, uh, of the spinal cord, uh, everything would be killing you. Everything would be terrible pain. Drinking hot tea would be excruciating. Sitting in chairs would be un uh, terrible. And we do see that in a condition called allodynia, where 
pain fibers become active even when they're not supposed to. If you touch someone gently and it creates pain when it shouldn't, we learned one mechanism of how that works last month from potentiation of pain. Uh, but also we can lose descending serotonergic inhibitory input from the pontomedullary system. Well, what lives in the pons and the medulla? The Rafe nuclei, uh, the, uh, the locus ceruleus, all of these nuclei which, which create neurotransmitters for one reason or another. One main reason is to create descending inhibition of pain. So if you're dealing with pain syndromes, one way that we may be able to reduce someone's pain syndrome is to activate the pontomedullary system. And we can only activate it so many ways as chiropractors. Well, we can activate it with cervical spine afferents or other afferents of the, uh, of the somatosensory system or special afferents like vestibular activations, right? So I had a patient ask me just yesterday, well, I have pain. What can I do to reduce my pain? And my first recommendation was to move, to create movement, create activation of other systems. So if you can activate systems related to the, let's say, the dorsal columns or the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the 1A afferents that come up from spindle systems, then you have a, a chance that you might centrally create a greater drive to this pontomedullary system, which would create a de uh, descending inhibition of pain. So very important to understand that we can influence pain by activating the brain and brain stem, and, uh, and that has an ipsilateral uh, uh, relationship. The second very important function of the medullary reticular formation is that it inhibits the inhibition of motor inner neurons, remember the Renshaw cells, to create ipsilateral postural muscle tone. So when I go to move my right arm and I use my prefrontal and supplementary uh, cortices and they tell, I say, okay, Mark, move that right arm. Well, that's going to send a signal to the basal ganglia and it's going to say, guys, I need you to release the thalamus so that I can move my arm. So I activate the putamen and the caudate. They actively inhibit the globus talus pars internus. That releases the thalamus from its, from its uh, inhibition. And the thalamus tells the, the primary motor cortex, go for it. Move that arm. Move your arm. And then I move my arm. But when I go to move my arm, I have to create a stabilization throughout the rest of my body. Or when I go to move my arm, I might fall over. Right, So we have to have this shunt stabilization. We have to have this postural integrity to do things. And you know that my clinical focus is scoliosis. And so we see this in the scoliosis population as well. When a scoliosis patient goes to work with some of their hands over their head, they immediately lose control of their trunk and they start to move their bodies into uh, uh, areas where they can use less energy to hold themselves up and ultimately they just lean on their scoliosis and they basically inhibit their shunt stabilizer muscles um, as part of their dysfunction. Well, when things are functioning normally, when I go to move a limb, the rest of my body has to stabilize. And so this is accomplished by the pontomedullary reticular formation creating inhibition to the inhibitors so that I can get activation. Okay, so remember in, in neuroscience, lots of things are built on inhibition. And when we lose inhibition, we get an escape. All right, so if I cannot inhibit the, the inhibitors of the motor neurons, then I get inhibition of the motor neurons and I get low tone. So when we have a patient and we tap their reflexes and we see that nothing's happening, nothing's happening in their, in their reflexes, uh, let's say on a deep tendon reflex, well, it may be that there's a problem in the re receptor in the Golgi tendon organ, or it may be that the supersegmental 
drive is not appropriate and we're not getting inhibition of the inhibitors. And so we get, uh, we get low tone. So I tap a reflex. I see that reflex is a zero. Well, I have to start to think centrally what mechanisms could make that zero. Well, if I hit the reflex and it doesn't move, well, it's either a problem at the receptor, it's either a problem at the, the spinal cord or the connections there in between, or it could be from descending systems that should be creating the, pro, the proper tone in that motor unit. So this is a great thing to understand because if I want to restore someone's reflex, I don't just keep hitting them on the reflex and think that's going to be enough of a stimulus to make a central neurological change. I often think of that like somebody who's bad at math. Well, you can practice math and you know, you know practice those numbers over and over again. You may not ever get the intellectual ability to solve that math problem just from practicing it. You may have to create other areas of brain have to improve before you can solve that problem. So if we look at a reflex of a patient and I, they have low tone, they're hypotonic, reflex is a plus one or something of that nature, well, I can create a change in the descending influence of that reflex by one mechanism maybe to create greater activation of the pontomedullary reticular formation, which creates a greater inhibition of the Renshaw, which allows, which allows for activation or an excitation, I should say, because remember, inhibition is also an activation, but it's, uh, it's not an excitation. All right. The third thing is, uh, is that the pontomedullary system inhibits the, uh, has a special inhibition of flexors. Very, very important to understand, and I do have some other slides that will that will graphically show this, but when we look at the body, where are our flexors, right? Our flexors are on the anterior aspect of our body above T6, and they're on the posterior aspect of the body, or the dorsal, I should say, right? It's ventral and dorsal. So the ventral uh, the flexors are above T6 ventrally. They are dorsal below T6. So if I were to lose inhibition of the flexors above T6, because I lost integration from brain to pontomedullary reticular formation, I'm going to end up with increased flexor tone. And isn't this exactly what we see when we look at patients that have brain injury? or we look at patients that have neurologic dysfunction that's even undiagnosed, or we look at people who have shoulder, chronic shoulder problems or chronic elbow problems, right? All of these can be related to poor angulation, poor joint position related to cortical influences. So if somebody has a stroke, we know that we see angulation of the shoulder, elbow, and wrist, all of the flexors become increased, right? And so we also see this in aging. What happens as we age? We lose our uh, ability to stay upright. We become more flex. We become more anterior. Our flexor tone increases, and our extensor tone tends to lose its integrity over time. So the pontomedullary system is important for us to release the flexors. So you know that when you're born, you're born, right, in the fetal position. Well, what is the fetal position? The fetal position is all about flexor tone being increased. And as we start to stimulate our brains, and the first stimulation to our brain is through the vestibular system, right? You're rocking in that fluid, right, in the amniotic sac and that movement that the mother gives the, uh, the unborn uh, um, fetus is starting to build the brain. And so the vestibular system is the first system that starts to build the brain. And we know that the vestibular system integrates directly into the pontomedullary reticular formation and also the vestibular nuclei that live right there. Why do you think you vomit sometimes when you activate the vestibular nuclei? Why, does, why do people get motion sick or seasick or why do rides make certain people nauseous and not others? 
It has to do that when you activate the vestibular nuclei, uh, that can spill over and activate adjacent structures. And the adjacent structure being the vomit center or the apneustic center. <gasps> Take a deep breath. Whoa, wow, that was, whoa, they dropped me from a high, you know, I was on the ride at Disney and when I dropped, I, I had an inspiratory uh, uh, reflex. So um, I think understanding this becomes really important for uh, the clinician. So where are the flexors below T6? Well, they're on the dorsal aspect of the body. And the flexors are like the hamstrings or a flexor of the of the uh, lower leg. Um, uh, and so same thing. We'll start to see when we have pontomedullary dysfunction or loss of integration, we're going to see tight hamstrings. And so when you're testing someone's muscle length and tone and rigidity and checking the turgor of their skin and doing all the things that you do in a split second when you're when you're a uh, a seasoned clinician. Don't take for granted that the the compartments of the uh, where the flexors are can give you a lot of influence can give you a lot of information about brain. So next time you look at someone's hamstring tone, think about it in terms of brain. And then check the compartments that are related to that and see if there are concurrent findings in, let's say, the flexors on the ventral side of the body in the, in the ipsilateral compartment. Okay, so that would tell you about brain on one side. All right, and the fourth uh, clinically relevant function of the pontomedullary reticular formation is that it inhibits the sympathetic output. It has an inhibitory influence over the intermediolateral cell column in the spinal cord, which we looked at um, last time. And here, I just increased your uh, view of the, uh, the small schematic here showing the reticulospinal tracts coming down uh, originating from uh, the nucleus reticularis pontus here, the medial reticulospinal tract, and then um, uh, the nucleus gigantis cellularis here, creating the lateral uh, descending pathways. Okay, um, there's also ascending pathways that stimulate our alertness. So. The medullary reticular formation is uh, important for us uh, to be aware of it. There are three distinct portions of it, um, the magnocellular, the, the uh, rafe nuclei, or the parvocellular, the rafe nuclei, and then the magnocellular out here. Um, I believe those are the magnocellular. Um, so, uh, Keep in mind this hierarchical relationship and remember that, well, how do I get to this brain, right? How do I get to this area? Well, we know that we can get to the area through the, uh, the cerebellum and the vestibular nuclei. And it's, it's important to know that 100% of all the sensory information that comes into your body will activate brainstem nuclei. Okay, the nucleus tractus solitarius and the nucleus ambiguous are sensory nuclei that all sensory afferents summate on, except the trigeminal afferents. Okay, so except the face. So that's why face and body are always dissociated, disassociated when we're dealing with neurological disease. So face on the left, body on the right, cranial nerve on the left, body on the right, right? So Knowing that we can get to these parts of our brain by activating sensory systems puts the chiropractor in a position where no other clinician is because no one can activate the receptor systems quite the way that we can. So here, again, just a schematic showing that the brain activates 10% ipsilaterally to the, uh, to the midbrain and then the 90% coming down. Oh, here's the 90% here, this big one, 
activating the pontomedullary reticular formation. The pontomedullary reticular formation, the brainstem, inhibits the IML, which is the intermediate lateral cell count. That means it is tonically inhibiting the uh, autonomics and the, and the expression of sympathetic drive, okay? And then, of course, the sympathetics inhibit the parasympathetics, so things above tend to inhibit things below. So here we're inhibiting the parasympathetics, uh, and this is why you, uh, you don't urinate on yourself, and sphincters don't just give out um, without us inhibiting the sympathetics first. So we got to inhibit the sympathetics to go to the bathroom, um, and so forth. So just knowing how this hierarchy works is, is uh, going to help you guys quite a bit in understanding what you're seeing with the uh with your patients so here's a question uh the pontomedullary reticular formation is synonymous with the brain stem of uncircumscribed uh gray matter so the pontomedullary reticular formation there's a reticular formation in the pons and there's a reticular formation in the in the medulla and we call it collectively the pontomedullary reticular formation and this is responsible for really modulating and controlling under direction of the, the, the brain, everything below it. So the uh, all the hypothalamic drive that comes down will synapse on the pontomedullary reticular formation. And uh, that's how we get output to our sympathetic nervous system. And the pontom uh, medullary reticular formation has to modulate that output. So 100% of receptor afferents, other than uh, afferents to the from the face, go to the nucleus tractus solitarius, also in the brainstem. So when you ask me, is it synonymous with brainstem? Yes, the the pontomedullary reticular formation is part of the brainstem, but it's not all of the brainstem. There's other parts that have their own nuclei. So this is all the stuff that's not a nuclei. All the rest of the stuff that's not nuclei is still something. It's still doing something. So when we look at this picture here, well, here are nuclei, but they're not, I'm sorry, these are uh, non-nuclei. These are just areas. And they are areas that they're not well circumscribed like in this picture. They're just areas that look like uh, unorganized tissue. Okay, the organized tissue are the are the nuclei, like the nucleus uh, gracilis and the nucleus gunatus and the vestibular nuclei, the nucleus tractus solitarius, the nucleus ambiguus. So, if I want to change someone's heart rate, or I want to change the uh, sympathetic vessel, uh, let's say uh, tone. Well, I could do it by activating receptor afferents, which drives the nucleus tractus, which some aid in nucleus tractus solitarius. And then I can change someone's vagal output, which can change their heart, okay? Uh, so question here is, so inhibiting sympathetics in some neuro ways controls micturation. Oh, absolutely. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't release that internal sphincter um, uh, volitionally, right? The only way the internal sphincter gets released is through a descending uh, um, inhibition of the sympathetics, which allow the parasympathetic system to summate and come up the threshold, which releases the internal sphincter, which then moves urine down and you get pressure, which gives you that interoceptive sense that, hey, I gotta go to the bathroom, and then you have to release the external sphincter yourself. And if you can't release it, then you get what's known as stage fright. That's a medically approved term. Uh, no, I'm kidding. So yes, so this is why we see things like neurogenic bladder, people who can't go to the bathroom because they've lost this ability to inhibit, super segmentally inhibit those, those pathways going uh, below. And in turn, when we see people who have incontinence or leaky uh, bladder or uh, things of that nature, uh, that they may lo lose the integrity of that internal sphincter. They may not have good uh, sympathetic activation. 
So yes, absolutely. These are all things that uh, can be influenced central neurologically. Uh, another question: New research is that correcting OSA in children admits not enteresis. Uh, OSA meaning uh, I'm not sure what OSA is. Tell me what OSA is, uh, Dr. Chapman. All right. So remember that the NTS, the nucleus tractus solitarius, is your friend. And the trigeminal nerves are the sensory superhighways to the brain stem, the thalamus, and ultimately the brain. And then the brain, through its descending 90% uh, integration into the pontomedullary reticular formation, modulates everything from pain to muscle tone to sympathetic function. It's all the, the safety pin cycle. So B.J. Palmer or D.D. Palmer, I guess, had it correct. This is the safety pin cycle teased out so that uh, teased out so that uh, we can communicate with other healthcare professionals. If I came up here and taught you the safety pin cycle, we would be done because it was just you know sensory, motor, and the back you know back and forth, and uh, and it seems simplistic, but that's all this is is the safety pin cycle. The um, the questions are showing up on the chat. So if you don't have your little chat spot open, you can open it up and then you can see. Oh, so Dr. Chapman says obstructive sleep apnea is is remitting, uh, helping to remit nocturnal enuresis in children. Well, we could definitely work back the 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 neurology of how that could work, right? And so reticular activating systems. Uh, are responsible for sleep wake, and um, I, I could see certainly that somebody who has sleep apnea is not activating their brain uh, pathways in ways that are consistent with deep sleep. They're not having REM sleep and sleep apnea, um, and so um, it's um, they're probably not getting full suppression of the uh of the the centers in the brainstem that are responsible for uh, uh for in, inhibiting wakefulness right because uh, if, if you're never fully asleep that means that you've got uh you've got neurotransmitter that's not getting blocked or not being um uh, uh dominated by uh, by uh, the neurotransmitters that would, would shut down our wake center. Okay, so so when we uh, adjust, let's say, someone's neck or we touch their neck or we reposition their head, we're stimulating these sensory superhighways up to the brainstem. And also consider the face as well because the trigeminal system is a, uh, has a massive nucleus in the brainstem. And obviously, the stimulation to the face is a very, very strong stimulation to brain. And so if any of you have ever been smacked in the face, the pain associated with it is quite shocking, right? And so think of trigeminal neuralgia, tic de la rue. This is a, a, a dysfunction of the trigeminal uh, nerve, maybe uh, an inflammation to the nerve or an infection to the nerve. And they consider the pain to be unbearable not to be consistent with with living and so they call it the suicide uh, disease and so think of the face as well and i know in the chiropractic neurology uh, world they do use facial stimulation and tongue stimulation to activate these trigeminal pathways certainly when you're putting a patient into a position for an adjustment or uh, um, you know, doing any type of exam, you may activate these systems, but just another thing to think about. What is the name of the Prezi? Right now we're not, question to me is what Prezi? Right now we're in the, uh, we're in the uh, uh, Google Drive under the CCG, uh, CCJ, what, documents it's called? Uh, and then we're under presentations. 
And this is your uh, upper UPC diplomate syllabus presentation. Okay, the brainstem is also looking at uh, uh, chemosensitivity. Right, there are chemo sensors in this uh, uh, in the nucleus tractus solitarius that are measuring blood sugar. That we're measuring um, um, pressure in the uh, baroreceptors. All of that's coming up to the to the nucleus tractus solitarius. Any sensory input going to the NTS. Okay. All right, and then you remember this uh, slide from the first week. We have a patient. They've got a problem. Where is the problem? It's anywhere in this slide. They can have a problem anywhere in this slide. Um, and it all is going to relate back to the patient's ability to be upright in gravity and have a sense of where their body is in space and so forth. So we're working our way through these things. Um, and some of them we're going to work on a little harder than others, but right now we're, we're talking about brainstem, the mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla. Understanding that this is the this is the a connection to the body, a brain to body, and realizing that everything that comes up into the into the uh, brainstem is going to have some influence suprasegmentally in the brain, and then everything coming out of the brain is going to influence these uh, these brainstem nuclei. Okay, but what I want you to take away is that we don't have to have pressure at the brainstem, uh, like a classic subluxation theory, to have dysfunction there. Or we, and also we don't have to adjust you at your brainstem to have influence to the cranial cervical junction. It's it's all going to have influence, so you can do something distal to that area and make change in that area. And uh, so just some, some food for thought there. All right, and then we work through this embryology. So we're going to skip over all the embryology stuff. We worked on uh, head posture control uh, a bit. And we're going to talk more about that uh, today. But uh, think of the, the suboccipital muscles as I'm passing this slide. These are sensory organs. Okay, they're not muscles, they're not primary mover muscles. You don't use your rectus capitis posterior minor to extend your head. Even though that's its function, its true function is to modulate and feed back to the brain about where your head is in space and to make help you make appropriate changes to head position. And these, as we uh, learned, I think I told you about the receptors, the muscle spindle, density in this area is far greater than in the rest of the neck and, and spine, right? Receptors, uh, muscle spindles are really uh, sensitive in the eye muscles. They're sensitive in, let's say, the hand muscles uh, and the neck muscles, right? So we need to know where these structures are in space. So the suboccipital muscles are sensory organs, okay? You might want to repeat that to yourself. The suboccipital muscles are sensory organs. They have so many receptors per gram compared to the rest of the, the uh, cervical spine musculature that we consider them sensory organs uh, as opposed to primary movers. Okay, I know I spoke about this slide last time, so I'm just going to move forward, get through the slides we spoke about. Okay, this slide, I'll just stop here briefly. We did talk about this, but here's that 23 degree angulation of the ocular uh, uh, orbits. Uh, and again, understanding the function of these cranial, uh, these ocular, extraocular uh, eye muscles is a fantastic thing for the cranial cervical junction practitioner because it gives you, it gives you a, a way to assess central neurological uh, control of these muscles. And of course, we talked about the vestibular influence over them as well. Let's just get through we, what we talked about, all this vestibular stuff and the vestibular ocular reflex. And we talked about 
the descending vestibulospinal reflexes, and we learned how to test those right, right with head shake and uh, head thrust test, and here's those uh, things. We talked about doing calorics. We never got to do them last time. Um, we talked about all this graviceptive systems. So somewhere in here, this is going to end. Yeah, so now we're up to our ocular motor systems, okay? Ocular motor function. We talked about uh, why we should study ocular motor function. And I quoted David Z and from his book, uh, The Neurology of Eye Movements. And uh, he states that to the neurobiologist, which are we not neurobiologists? I don't know. Well, we're, we're, we're terminal clinical clinicians who definitely need to know about neurology and neurobiology. Uh, but to, to look to the study of the eye movements presents a unique opportunity to understand the workings of the brain. And so, you know, you have to be careful when you talk to patients. You don't want to say, well, you're something wrong with your brain. I mean, maybe you do, but, um, uh, and I've had that experience because I was looking at eye movements and the patient was, well, why aren't you looking at my spine? And I tried to express that, well, I can look at motor function by looking at your eye movements. They're very sensitive to any dysfunction. And it can tell me if something's wrong with the brain. And, of course, she didn't like that because she didn't want to think that something was wrong with her brain. She came to me for a back problem. And so um, I learned to be a bit cautious in how I explain this. But if we look at this, uh, this blue-eyed patient here, we see that those eyes are not aligned well. We see that we have a light reflex from this pupil. You can see the little white spot on the reflect. Uh, reflection of the uh, pupil and then we see that the light reflex is not aligned well here now this is not a consensual light reflex that you would test by testing eye in uh, light in the eye in, a, in an alternating manner but you could see this light reflex uh, does give us some inf information about uh, the relationship of the eye muscles so this eye is to the nose and this eye is elevated when it comes to the nose so what muscle is supposed to depress the eye when it comes to the nose? All right. And if you guys answer on the chat, tell me the, uh, the muscle that should depress the eye when it comes to nose. That would give me some encouragement to, to see how well you've kind of taken in that information from this morning. Yeah, it's the superior oblique muscle, right? So when the eye comes to nose, the superior oblique muscle should depress it. If it doesn't, it tells me that other muscles must be dominating it. And so I could test its function by actually taking my finger after I brought the eye to the nose and then having them follow down to see if they could depress it if they wanted. I might even do a cover test. I might cover the good eye here and then see if they do it to see if I've got a problem with the, with the muscle itself. I might be dealing with a superior oblique palsy here, and it may be because the nerve, the trochlear nerve was severed from a head injury or something of that nature, right? You guys are dealing with this population that can post concussion, trauma, super oblique palsy is a very, very common uh, injury compared to the other brainstem uh, injuries because of its, its uh, path around the whole brainstem. So, but if I go in there and I test her and she depresses the eye and it's not a loss of function of the nerve, well, then it's a, it's, a, it's a loss of modulation. It's a loss of tone. It's a loss of integration. And that's where we are prepared to intervene. Because if there's a palsy, what am I going to do? I'm not going to reconnect the nerve. Um, if the nerve is severed, you know, it's not going to come back uh, that way. But if it's an integration problem and I test the muscle and the muscle works, hey, then it's just about making it... Uh, making it uh, integrate better. And it might be I have to, I have to reduce the uh, tone of the superior oblique muscle. I'm sorry, the superior rectus muscle, right? Or the inferior oblique muscle, which is an elevator. So I'd look for, okay, well, this eye is elevated when it came to the nose. It tells me the inferior oblique is dominating over the superior oblique. Uh, and why is that? Well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to start to test other parts of the the, the the brainstem to see if I can localize a problem related to that superior oblique nerve, uh, the trochlear nerve related to the superior oblique muscle on the left. Well, the superior oblique muscle on the left is innervated by the right 
trochlear nucleus and the right trochlear nerve. So I'm going to go start testing things in the brainstem on the right to see if I can find something else that localizes that right brainstem, right? And then I'm going to look for long track signs related to the right brainstem. Where would long track signs show up? On, related to the left side of the body. So either some sort of motor control problem on the left side of the body or some sort of sensory loss on the left side of the body. Okay. Now, would I use cover or uncover to help distinguish what I'm seeing here? I'm absolutely going to do a full exam. If I see a patient like this, I'm going to do everything I can to start to try to localize. If I put them back in a primary position with eyes uh, neutral and do cover, uncover, both by letting them verge vision and by not letting them create vergence of vision um, to identify if it's related to vision itself or if it's related to just extra, extraocular muscle uh, positioning. And uh, would I do it in this position? Absolutely. I'm going to do... I mean, once I see a dysfunction, I'm not going to just say, well, no big deal. It just doesn't go down as much as the other side, which is what we would have done before today because we didn't have the tools to know what it is. Uh, so, yes, you're going to work through your patient's uh, dysfunctions and try to bring it back and localize it to the brain stem, brain, cerebellum wherever in the system that dysfunction may, may have originated. All right, so you have here your extraocular uh, muscles, your cranial nerve breakdown, cranial nerve three uh, innervates the medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus, uh, the inferior oblique muscle, the superior palpebri uh, muscle. It's also uh, responsible for the intrinsic pupillary constriction. So when you do consensual light reflexes, you're testing cranial nerve three as well. They're all sub nuclei within the cranial nerve. So you remember the edinger westphal nucleus, that's the actual part of the nucleus that is responsible for the intrinsic pupillary constrictor, different than the sub nucleus for the superior rectus, inferior rectus, superior oblique. Um, and uh, the superior oblique muscle is actually innervated bilaterally by this cranial nerve three. And so if you had a nuclear lesion in cranial nerve three, you're going to get a superior rectus paresis on both sides. Okay. Cranial nerve four, we know, is the trochlear nerve. They call it the trochlear nerve because uh, it, uh, uh, the, the superior oblique muscle wraps around that little trochlear uh, uh, hook in the, uh, in, in the superior orbit. Um, and remember the superior, uh, the superior oblique has a contralateral innervation. So if you see a superior oblique paresis on the left, you've got to think right brainstem. Well, what else is in the right brainstem? Well, cranial nerve three on the right, cranial nerve six on the right, right? Although cranial nerve six is a little further down, it's in the pons. Cranial nerve three is in the medulla, uh, sorry, in the midbrain. And so we'd be looking for more midbrain findings, maybe looking at the rubrospinal pathways, looking at the long track signs, or, um, or the dorsal spinal cerebellar pathways, or something like that. Cranial nerve six is the lateral rectus. It receives activation directly from the brain. That's why we call cranial nerve six the master, and we call cranial nerve three the slave when we're looking at yoking of eye movements, okay? So if I want to track a target, and let's say the tips of my fingers are my eyeballs, and the target moves towards my right, well, the, the brain, the parietal brain, is going to see the target. It's going to initiate movement by connecting to the contralateral pons, and it's going to activate my lateral rectus muscle, and my eye is going to move well, then there's going to be a connection from the lateral rectus nuclei, right, the, uh, the abducens nuclei, that's going to connect to the opposite side, to the, to the cranial nerve 3 nuclei, so that the eyes move together. And remember, we talked about this last month, that if the eyes don't move together, if they move like European windshield wipers, 
That's called an intranuclear ophthalmopalegia. And this is a very common finding that will be overlooked most of the time in your patient population, mostly because we don't look at it. But even when we look at it, you're going to say to yourself, well, uh, oh, your eyes don't exactly yoke together. They're kind of a little off. Oh, well. Well, not anymore. Now we know that that's related to that that uh, uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus, which connects those two, two brainstem nuclei. And if we don't get yoking of eyes when people are trying to track targets, then we know that we're dealing with potentially brainstem uh, uh, involvement there. And the medial longitudinal fasciculus, the connection between cranial nerve six and cranial nerve three is a myelinated structure that is susceptible to uh, early demyelination. So in our MS patients or people who have demyelinating disease, we're gonna look for this ability to yoke our eyes back and forth because that's gonna give us a window into that diagnosis. All right, we spoke, I think, uh, this morning well about the extraocular muscles and their alignment. Here's that trochlear hook here showing the uh, cranial nerve, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, superior oblique muscle. Okay, and uh, we talked about some of these movements that we can test in our patients to identify uh, central, that identify central neurological uh, function. My wife just tried to blend things. Sorry about that. Um, so we look at all of these uh, uh, functions today. All right, so smooth pursuits um, will be next. Looking at uh, looking at the eyes, the eye muscles for primary, secondary, and tertiary functions. We talked about that at length this morning. Put the eye to the nose, see if it elevates and depressed. Put the eye out laterally, see if it elevates and depressed. Uh, when you bring the eyes straight up, look for torsion of the eyes. When you bring the eyes straight down, look for deviation or torsion of the eyes. That's going to give you information about the uh, activation of these uh, systems, okay? You have it all listed here, primary, secondary, and tertiary functions of each of these eye muscles, all right? So if you're starting to see dysfunction, you're going to look at these eye muscles and you're going to come back to your notes and say, wow, that eye, when I brought it up, it intorted. What does that mean? Okay, well, what muscles intort the eye? All right, well, in the primary position, it's the superior obliques. So that tells me if I have my patient look up to the ceiling by tracking a target and one eye in torts, well, that tells me that, that the oblique muscle became active when it shouldn't have, or that the inferior oblique failed and allowed the, the superior oblique to become a torter. And so starting to work in reverse is going to be easy for you guys. You don't have to memorize all this and the truth is it's very hard to memorize it unless you're uh, and you want to create mnemonics and stuff it's just if you're going to work with these systems you're going to start to learn it that way so just like long-term memory creates architectonic changes in in synapses the more you work with these they'll start to, uh, you know, the ones that you see all the time, you're gonna to start to, they're gonna become functional for you. So let's look at this here and see if when we take this patient virtually through uh, cardinal signs of gaze, what types of uh, uh, things that we might be able to pick up. So if we look at this middle plate here, and we look at these two eyes, this looks like most of our patients. Okay, our eyes are not aligned perfectly. So, what do we see here? Elevated right eye. Okay, maybe external extortion or uh, external torsion of that right eye. Maybe uh, uh, the external torsion here. It's kind of yeah. It looks like this. Uh, this uh, lateral aspect is a little lower than this here, uh, but clearly we see that this eye is low. Can we see, uh, uh, do we know anything else yet? 
right? All we know is that we've got a hypertropia on one side or a hypotropia on the left on the other side. What happens when we have them look up? Okay, do we see torsion in real, li real time? You might be able to pick up more torsions here, but looks okay. How about if we have them look down? And this uh, here, eyes look pretty good down. How about up and to the left? All right, mm, let's compare that. I'd probably compare that to the other side to see if I can pick up anything. How about up and to the right? Patient looks pretty good there. I don't see a whole lot of difference. Maybe they can't elevate their eyes as high to the right as they do to the left. I think that's probably true. This eye looks like it comes up pretty strongly compared to this one. Do you guys agree? So the right eye here, you can see that we lose about half the pupil. When we look at the left eye here, we don't lose half the pupil. That's how subtle these things are. So unless you really take time and look at this, this could look pretty like like all lots of patients we see. How about looking down? We look in this uh, area here. We look down and to the right. All right. I look at the pupils. Okay. How about here when when she looks down and to the left? I think this is pretty clear. This eye does not depress as well when it comes to the nose. Okay. And then when we have them uh, look here and just hold the eyes up. Same thing here. Um, Look how much of the eye disappears, how much of the pupil and the iris disappears when she looks down and to the right as compared to down and to the left. Now, if you just took this one down and to the left and looked at it, it doesn't look like much, okay? This is a patient with a, with a confirmed superior leak paresis. All right, so, oh, did we lose sound? Sorry. No sound, restarted meeting, but still nothing. Okay, let us know. Mark, this is uh, you're still coming through on sound, but it's uh, they just got to restart over and over. I think, they, I think they've got to reset uh, on their end. That's it. Just doesn't automatically reconnect always. Okay. Um, all right. So looking at these systems and how subtle they are. Okay. So we got your back. So basically, just to review, we were looking at, now that we know the idea that in primary, in different positions, muscles have different functions. They have primary functions, they got secondary, and they have tertiary functions. Up in here, we've, I've listed the functions, okay? And so when we look at the superior oblique, which is the most commonly paretic muscle, we're going to look at our patients, and if you look at this middle this middle plate here, this looks like every patient in our clinics. It does in my clinic. I rarely ever see people with perfectly aligned structures. And so what does this tell us? Well, it doesn't tell us much yet, except that we have a hypertropia. Hypertropias can happen from a lot of different ways. Uh, and just the question is uh, extort, uh, the concept of what extort and intort means. And so just to give you just a little background, when the superior pole of the eye rolls towards, let's say, towards the nose, so here's the nasal side, when the superior pole of the eye rolls towards the nose about the axis of the pupil. So imagine I stuck a skewer through the pupil, and then we're rolling the eye around the skewer. That's intorsion and extorsion. That's a cyclotorsional deviation, okay? And so uh, when we talk about extorsion of the eye, we're talking about a rolling of the superior pole towards, uh, I'm sorry, extorsion of the eye, rolling the superior pole away from the nose. Intorsion of the eyes when we roll the superior pole towards the nose. Okay, so that just tells you what extortion and intortion of the eye means. Um, okay, and so here we're just talking about elevation and depression. And when the patient looks to the left and tries to look, well, actually, this is just pure left gaze. This is left and down. So when they look to the left, you can see this subtle imbalance where the, this eye does not depress well compared to this one. So actually, in this in this plate here, it's elevating. Okay. 
So let me see, I'm gonna have to plug in soon. Um, I guess we'll take, uh, what time do you wanna take lunch, Fred? After uh, one? All right, we take lunch at maybe about 12.30. Okay, so another hour? Yeah, I think so, but maybe take about a 10 minute break right now. Okay, all right, let's take a 10 minute break. And uh, we'll come back 